This is the video for pre-lecture 21. In lecture 21, we're going to be reviewing by working through an example that features two fluids, in this case, oil and water. Oil is less dense than water, so it will sit above it, and is more viscous. And so we have an example here where we have two different fluids which have different viscosities, meaning that our viscosity is varying as a function of spatial position. It should also be noted that oil and water are immiscible, meaning that there's no natural diffusion that's occurring between the two. It requires some agitation to mix the two fluids together, which ultimately produces what's called an emulsion. And even that, given a long enough period of time, can return the system back to the two-layered state. So for our example, we're going to be looking at the time-dependent Navier-Stokes equation, and we're going to make a number of simplifying assumptions. We're going to make the assumption that our velocity is exclusively in the u direction, and that our variation is exclusively in the y direction. So that's going to allow us to eliminate a number of terms. Because we have no variation in x, we can get rid of this term, and because we have no vertical velocity, we can get rid of that. We're also going to go ahead and assume that we can get rid of this term because of no variation in x, and that our pressure variations in our x direction, at least for now, can be considered negligible. So that leaves us with two terms. We have our time-dependent term, du dt, and our gradients in the y direction. So that reduces to our simple, simpler equation du dt is equal to d by dy of mu du, d, uh, mu du dy, where I should say that this should really be a new variable representing mu over rho. So the question then is, okay, well, what equation should we be using? So clearly in the oil, we should be using our Navier-Stokes equation with our new equal to whatever our new oil is. Similarly, in our water section, we should use our Navier-Stokes, where new is equal to our new water. Well, what happens right at the interface? Obviously, at our edges, we do put nodes at our boundaries. These are where we get our boundary conditions. So the question then is, okay, well, what do I do about the interface? At the interface, the shear force must be matched from both sides, which means mu du dy is equal to mu du dy for both the water and the oil. So we have to be a little bit careful here because we've got a couple of different properties. We've got our mu viscosity versus our nu viscosity. And certainly we'll be making sure those are clarified on any sort of problem statement. So we want to, again, be careful though with how we implement this particular equation because we want to make sure that when we're doing this, we're perhaps doing a sided finite difference approximation as with this as well. So let's work through what are the actual equations that we would be modeling. So we've got a number of boundary conditions for our u for y equals to 0. That's equal to u water. So u1 is equal to n plus 1 is equal to u water. And finally, our u7, n plus 1, is equal to u oil. So we have Dirichlet boundary conditions that are really driving the system. Okay. Then we have a finite difference equation that we're going to need to model. And for now, we're going to say that, yes, our viscosity is a function of y, but within each layer, the viscosity itself is constant. And so that's going to allow us to write our governing equation in the water region as rho water times du dt is equal to mu water times d squared u dy squared. And if we're doing a 
implicit Euler centered space approximation, this is going to reduce to du dt is equal to nu water t squared u dy squared, which can be then converted to ui n plus 1 is equal to ui n plus delta t times nu water times ui minus 1 n plus 1 minus 2 ui n plus 1 plus ui plus 1 n plus 1 all divided by delta x squared. So if we go ahead and give ourselves a beta w equals to delta t times new water over delta x squared, our coefficients for this are going to be minus beta water, 1 plus 2 beta water, and minus beta water. And we would repeat that here as well. And that's going to be equal to u 2n, and this will be u 3n. Our Dirichlet boundary condition. And then on the other side, in our oil regime, we would have similarly a minus beta oil, 1 plus 2 beta oil, minus beta oil, u5n okay so then the question becomes okay well what am I supposed to do for that interface well what we said is that at the interface, mu oil du dy is equal to mu water du dy. So now we have to make finite difference approximations for our derivatives, but we want to do si appropriately sided difference approximations. So our oil is above our water, so we're going to do a forward approximation. So that'll be u naught times mu or use u5 n plus 1 minus u4 n plus 1, where u4 is our value at the interface, divided by delta x, is equal to mu water times a backward approximation of du dy. So that would be u4 n plus 1 minus u3 n plus 1, divided by delta x. So we've done only a first order approximation of our derivatives. We could certainly do a higher order approximation if we need to or want to. So now we have to rearrange this equation to get all the u n plus 1 terms on the same side. And that ultimately leaves nothing on the right hand side. So our b value for this will be 0. And if we move from left to right, we get the following mu w plus mu oil over delta x for our u4 n plus 1 term, and then minus mu w over delta x for our u3 term, and minus mu oil over delta x for our u5 term. Well, having a spatially varying viscosity can be the result of having multiple different types of fluid in your system. Another way to have a spatially varying viscosity is to have what's called a non-Newtonian fluid. And so we're going to look at just two examples of a non-Newtonian fluid in our system. And this is a relationship between our derivative, du dy, and our shear stress, which is proportional to the effective viscosity. And so a Newtonian fluid is the one with a straight linear relationship between the two, where our viscosity is effectively the slope of this line. And if we look at our shear thickening and shear thinning lines, these now have viscosities that are a function of the velocity gradient. So let's see what that means 
in reality. So an example of a shear thinning fluid is ketchup. So in this case, we're seeing what happens when we compress the ketchup. We see that once we start compressing, we start to see a nice amount of flow. Perhaps this is even better visualized with this golf ball example. We place a golf ball on the shear thinning fluid and it gradually starts to sink, but it's taking quite a while. So what happens though if we hit the golf ball into the ketchup at a much higher rate of speed? Well, the high speed camera, we can see now the golf ball has no problems bouncing into the ball of ketchup. So the higher velocity gradient, because the ball is going faster, results in a lower viscosity or a lower effective viscosity of the ketchup itself. So that's the idea of a shear thinning. The larger the gradients, the weaker the viscosity. The opposite is a shear thickening fluid. And so an example of a shear thickening fluid is cornstarch. So here we put the golf ball on the cornstarch mixture, easily starts to just fall right to the bottom of the bowl. But, and what he's showing here, is as you pull the golf ball out at a higher rate of speed, you're increasing the shear, you're increasing the DUDY, which results in a much stronger viscosity. So when they throw the ball into the cornstarch, you see it actually bounces on the surface before slowing down to a point where the gradients and velocity are low enough that it can sink back. So we'll be discussing both of these results as well as how we would go about modeling them in the lecture.